Good morning once again. I'm going to ask if you have your copy of God's Word. And if you're not already turned there, turn to Exodus, the 29th chapter, as Pastor Stephen has read for us. Exodus 29, on the uh, ordaining of the priests, Aaron and his sons, and the continued uh, priesthood through the Old Testament as well. Um, and we use the word ordination still today when we ordain um, pastor, elder, overseers. Uh, we even, uh, in our tradition, uh, ordain deacons. Um, and I would say as, as a pastor ordained and being, going through the ordination process to be called uh, to the gospel ministry is a memorable experience. Um, for, there's friends people that I went to seminary with, my own church family there at the time, my family, all in agreement, recognizing the call of God to set me apart for the gospel ministry. There's a whole service, you know, dedicated to the Lord, but also a charge, reminding the church who they are, how they are to follow Christ, the preaching of the word, and who, what are my, my responsibilities to remember to preach the word in season and out of season. But Above all these things is the weighty reality of the calling. It's not just the uh, memorableness of, you know, family and church people and friends from seminary that are all there. Above all this is that weighty reality of the calling of a pastor. I have to fulfill the duties of this gospel ministry that I'm ordained to do, and it's all before the face of God. So to handle the, the Bible rightly is not just a, because we say so. It is because that is the preaching of God's word. It is his voice speaking. And to do this in an unworthy manner, to, to do this in a prideful way, or to, to abuse this office before the face of God, we see the consequences for Aaron and the sons and acting as a, a priest in a way that is either strange or unauthorized or whatever word that your translation uses. And so this is what I called to do. Open this text to feed the, the, the lambs of Christ. So I pray that you have come hungry, that I pray that you will also be satisfied and let us go to the Father together as we study Exodus 29 together. Heavenly Father, I lift this prayer to you. That as we have come in, your people, we have come in from a cruel world, Many of us are deeply wounded. Some of us are weeping. Many of us are rejoicing. And Lord, um, we gather together to be fed from your word. So Lord, we thank you for this very hour that was set apart from the week where we just quietly sit and hear the voice of our Savior. So Lord, we ask that you would show us, Christ, the beauty of who he is through your word. That we see this gospel and rejoice. Lord, we need your mercies. Our anxious hearts need your peace. Our uh, wounded lives, our wounded souls need your healing. So, Lord, to your mercies we call. We ask that your joy would be in us, that our joy would be complete, that the peace of Christ that surpasses understanding would guard our hearts and our minds from the evil one. And Lord, teach us all these things through your word. So we lift this prayer to you. And we ask for your mercies. Receive them with thanksgiving and with joy. In Jesus' name, amen. So you've, said, you've heard uh, the voice of God say, Thus you shall ordain Aaron and his sons. So ordination, ordain, that is fill the office of priest. And by this ordination, the priesthood shall be theirs by a statute forever. And the word there forever. This, this seven-day ordination service dedicates priests into the service of Yahweh as a sign, as he says at the end of the chapter, uh, of his dwelling with his people. And it is a statute forever, or perpetual, always ongoing. And then the word Yahweh used for his statute, which belongs to him, for the priesthood serving him, is perpetual, forever, ongoing. This means generation after generation. It means the Israelites must 
by command of God, who made this covenant with them, they must ordain their priests in this way to serve him ongoing as a statute forever. This is all leading to a forever priest for God's people. But you see this here at the beginning. Where is this leading? How is, he, how is God to be served? To be prepared for consecration before uh, priestly duties, these priests must be uh, washed from head to toe. You see, that he's, the Lord says, bring them before the tent of meeting and now wash them with water, symbolizing a spiritual cleansing. Then the garments are to be worn after the washing for the ordination or the filling of the office of priest. Oil is then poured on his head to display for all that this is a man set apart. But we see this a little bit more clearly when we get to the Psalms. In Psalm 133, this is one of the songs of the ascent. So you imagine Israel is singing this on their way up to worship God. It says this in Psalm 133, Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. Running down. So if you have this idea that, you know, they just took a little bit of oil and put it on his head, that is not the case. This is an overwhelming amount of oil being poured and is dripping off of his beard, off of his hair, onto his holy garments as he is about to enact the, the filling of the office of priests, serving the Lord. So oil is really poured to the point the oil is running down Aaron or the priest's beards and garments. There's spices mixed into this as well. So imagine the smell change, right? You come out of the wilderness, which is just teeming with people and animals and outdoorsy smells, right? And they're washed ritually before the tent of meeting with water. And now they're drenched with this pleasant smelling oil. David in this psalm, in Psalm 133, compares living in harmony, in unity, of God's people, as this level of sweetness, this pleasantness of the symbolic cleansing of the, whole, of the high priest who has come to do the holy service of the Lord. If the Israelites ascending the hill of the Lord to worship could live in such harmony by this sweet following the, of the high priest, how much more now, since we have such a great high priest in Christ, we who follow him have the sweetness of the unity, a sweet aroma into the nose of God is God's people entering into church services in harmony, which is a delight in the heart of our God, in which we have gathered here right now to gather and to worship. But, so the prepared priesthood, dressed for service, now must offer sacrifices. So um, God outlines it, one bull, two rams. Uh, the bull and two rams were brought by the priest at the entrance of the t tent of meeting. Uh, and uh, that, is the meet that tent of meeting is the, where man meets with Yahweh. So there's a bull. And he's taken the bull and it's a sin, he says it's a sin offering. So before Moses is to slaughter this bull... The priests would put their hands on the head of the bull and is symbolizing a transfer of guilt of sin onto the bull. Remember, the high priest has the names of the tribes of Israel near his heart as he's doing this. So he's there as representing. This is all of your people, God. Putting his hands on the bull, the transference of the guilt of Israel. And the, the blood uh, was splattered on the bronze altar making the, the altar holy, God says, and ready for use. The unclean clean parts of the bull was taken outside of the camp. There's more on this later. Next, the bull itself is uh, burned on the altar as an atoning sacrifice for the people. The, the unholiness, the, the wickedness of the priests transferred upon the bull, and God executes his death penalty for the priest's sins by placing his wrath on their substitute, this bull, this bull that God calls the sin offering. 
And next, Moses brings in a ram. And the priests placed place their hands on it as well. The, the ram was slaughtered and blood sprinkled on the sides of the altar. This time, the entire ram was to be consumed by fire upon the altar. This is the, the whole burnt offering. It symbolized a committed devotion to the entire priest into the service of Yahweh. We dedicate it to you, Lord. The, the second ram, the priests placed their hands on just the same. But this ram is dedicated to just the priesthood. It is a blood sacrifice, so the ram does symbolize atonement. But it isn't for all of Israel. It is just for the priests. The exposed parts of the priests, their ears, their right thumb, right toe, sprinkled with the bull's blood, covering the parts not covered by the holy garments. They're totally covered, right? And, and the only, it's only on the right side. It's on the side of honor. But next, the blood is then splattered on their garments as well, mixed with oil. So there's no, there's no entrance into God's presence without the shedding of blood and the covering of blood. They're covered. You see this in uh, Exodus 29, verses 18 and then 25. It says, uh, Burn the whole ram on the altar. It is a burnt offering to the Lord. It is a pleasing aroma, a food offering to the Lord. So the first ram is a food offering to the Lord here. And um, you, you see this in verse 25. It says, uh, uh, you shall take uh, them from their hands and burn them on the altar on the top of the burnt offering as a pleasing aroma before the Lord. It is a food offering, Lord. So these are pleasing aromas as they burn. God is saying, this, is, this smells good to me. It's a pleasing aroma. It is pleasing because it was done in obedience to God in accordance to his scriptures. So see this. He's not saying, oh, because you've done something that really makes me feel good. He says, no, I told you what to do. You obeyed, and that is a pleasing aroma because it's in accordance with my scripture. I want you to think of this, though. In Leviticus 10, two sons of Aaron came into the tabernacle complex and lit what my version calls an unauthorized fire. Um, I, I like strange. It's a strange fire. This is a fire that God said not to do. They were priests performing duties before the one true God. Right? It, it is right before his face. And when we have this tendency to think that idolatry is just worshiping other gods or worshiping statues, and yet we find in the Torah this idea that we, a lot of our idolatry is worshiping the one true God in a way he did not authorize, any way he said not to do. The fire of God's presence instantly came out and killed these two sons of Aaron, these two priests with their strange fire. Their bodies charred and taken outside the camp, but they were carried by the holy garments. Their garments were left untouched by the fire. We we are to have the pleasing aroma of Christ wherever we go. Both before God and before men. Before one another. We are not to, uh, we're not authorized to worship a God in a way he says not to do. We are to do things in accordance to his scriptures. Uh, so in this, in this uh, light, let's think upon Ephesians 5 then, in 1 through 2. Paul writes to the church in Ephesus, Be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Now read this. A fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. What is the pleasing aroma of the sacrifice before God for me? Is Christ. Therefore, be imitators of God. Therefore, it comes after this. And what pleases God is only the aroma of Christ. And so let us imitate him. Let us make holy disciples who imitate us, in so doing, imitate Christ. If someone's going to imitate me, my prayer is that they're imitating my follow with Christ. And so this is the, this is the uh, immediate outpouring of where Paul is drawing from. Being a kingdom of priests means that, and when we make disciples, we're making holy disciples 
So let us raise our children to imitate us as we imitate Christ. It is a pleasing aroma, and no other life of worship pleases God. So let us do so by faith. By the end of this ceremony each day, as you imagine, blood was everywhere. This is a lot of blood. These aren't small animals. So large animals. Large bull, two large rams. These large animals' blood was all over the altar of the Lord. It's on the exposed sin of the priests and all over their garments. Hebrews 9.22 reads, Under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. This massive, bloody affair is showing what it means to be a sinner before God's face. And what it takes to have our forgiveness. The ceremonially washed priest would be robed in righteousness, ready for service at the end of this, anointed with oil, sprinkled with lots of blood. This is all important as it points to the deep spiritual truths from before time in Christ our Lord. We have emphasized that Christ fulfilling the tabernacle as he, the word became flesh and tabernacle dwelt among us. The golden lampstand points to Christ being the light of the world, the bread of the presence to Christ, the bread of life. Christ is the only way to the Father, into God's presence. Yet Christ performed his perfect sacrifice as the per perfect priest, the perfect fulfillment of the priesthood. As the bull had unclean parts taken outside the camp, representing the uncleanliness of God's people taken away from the camp of which God lives with his people. In um, Hebrews, the 13th chapter, uh, Hebrews 13, 12 through 14, picks up on this. I actually start with 11. The bodies of those animals, which ones we are re reading now, whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin, are burned outside the camp. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. The high priest would take the unclean parts outside the camp. And what does Hebrews say? It's exactly where Jesus went. He's a sacrifice to us by his own blood. Uh, we esteemed him afflicted. He bore our iniquities. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He does the laying on. Just like the laying on of hands on this bull. The Lord did this laying of our iniquity upon Christ. This, Isaiah, this is all in Isaiah 53. And Hebrews picks up on this and then reminds us the, this sacrificial lamb of God was taken outside the camp. Jesus atoned for our sin outside the camp into the place of disease and death, which is the wages of our sin. The death penalty God executes on Christ is our substitute. He suffers where we do not because of faith in him. The, the tabernacle of God took on sin, although he knew no sin. He's taken outside the camp into the ugly place of disease and sin-filled world in which we live. He went into the valley of the shadow of death to die our death, to kill death forever. We get Christ as our perfect sacrifice to make us right before God. But often we, we miss the point that he is also performing himself as sacrifice as the Lord who laid on him the iniquity of us all. Christ performed performs this sacrifice once for all sin as the great final high priest. Jesus is called our priest over and over again through Hebrews. I don't know how somebody missed this. He is our priest. He has made us, you, me, kingdom of priests. We are the royal priesthood. If you are you still there in Hebrews, I want to pick this up in chapter 7. Uh, in Hebrews 7, 11 through 12, and then 15 through 17. There's not time to go through this entire chapter, but 
Um, now, if the perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, f- what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek rather than the one named after the order of Aaron? For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. So he's picking up on this. How does Jesus fulfill this high priesthood of Aaron? Well, because he came before him. Because he comes to the order of Melchizedek. Because he has come by the the order of he is the great high priest selected before time. But he continues this in verses 15 through 17. He says, this becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek. That's who is Christ. Who has become a priest, not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him, you are a priest, now there's the word, forever. After the order of Melchizedek. The priesthood we read about today in Exodus 29 is fulfilled, but not by Aaron and his sons. It is by Christ. That is, a forever priest to fulfill the forever statute to serve the the Lord perfectly. Simple language. Jesus is the perfect sacrifice, yet this perfect sacrifice needed a perfect priest who would perfectly serve the Father perpetually, generation after generation, and forever. Christ is our great high priest. He forever lives. He forever serves. He forever intercedes before the Father. He is forever serving as the great high priest. Now back to Exodus 29. Um, Let's see this in verses 31 through 34. You shall take the ram of ordination and boil its flesh in a holy place. And Aaron and his son shall eat the flesh of the ram and the bread that is in the basket in the entrance of the tent of meeting. I shall eat those things with which atonement was made at their ordination and consecration. But an outsider shall not eat of them because they are holy. And if any of the flesh of the ordination or of the bread remain until morning, then you shall burn the remainder with fire. It shall not be eaten because it was holy. Again, Yahweh commands a meal. But the priests enjoy a meal only with the ram of ordination here, then later on with just the bread. This, again, reflects, uh, is reflected in Yahweh's confirmation of his covenant back in chapter 24, if you remember. He brings the elders before him and commands a meal to be had. This meal is quite special to the priesthood for their ordination and consecration. Think of this. The, The ram whose blood the priests were currently wearing were being, was a flesh, or sorry, a meat that was being eaten as a feast commanded by God before the face of God. The priests enjoying this meal would know directly the connection of eating and drinking or whatever you do to the glory of God. Directly they understood that. This is, we offered this wine, this bread, this ram before God. We are wearing its blood, and we are wearing holy garments given to us by God. We have been made righteous because God is a forgiving God. And now we sit to eat this meal. They know direct connection of the eating and drinking before the face of God to the glory of God. You see, this wine and this bread of the presence of And this ram were not sacrificed to idols, but before the face of the living God. When you delight in a meal, whenever you eat or drink or whatever you do, you're commanded to do all this to the glory of God. If if we are truly a kingdom of priests, then every meal that we have, it needs to be done in a thankful heart to God. God is not just a, a provider. He has given us meals. But we are to make this direct connection. He's given us all these things. Why? Because this meal was provided by a loving Heavenly Father who values you more than sparrows. So don't, don't disconnect the idea of what, how God sees you in Christ. This is saying how lowly I am. Yes, you are lowly before God, but not lowly when it comes to the idea that Christ's righteousness is what you are clothed in. Don't just, don't just self, 
deprecate, go to say exaltation of who Christ is. I enjoy this meal to the glory of God. He feeds me with daily bread. This is a feast to the glory of God. And the week after, uh, the, this, after this week of ceremony and feast, the priests are ordained to the office of priesthood. Every day, a lamb would be sacrificed in the morning, and then another one at night, day in, day out, combined with grain, oil, wine, the sign of perpetual or ongoing or continual devotion before the Lord. And the Lord says it is a pleasing aroma. If you would, last places Romans the 12th chapter Romans Paul picks up on this as our own priesthood before the Lord Romans 12 the first two verses I appeal to you therefore my brothers by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God which is your spiritual worship do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And if I remember Paul's writings, think about these things. Whatever is excellent, whatever is pure and true, is this what your mind is consumed by? You see this, our very lives, our very bodies are living sacrifice. To get this, living, perpetual, ongoing, this, this pleasing aroma of our priesthood under Christ, our high priest, as a kingdom of priests, his royal priesthood is not, is not found in conforming to this world. But our spiritual worship before our God is with our minds renewed by God's word, and that through testing we prove his power at work in us. Our priesthood isn't serving God with strange fire. It is serving God in accordance to his scripture. So I know the Bible well. I walk through this valley of the shadow of death knowing it is with me. And I am thinking about whatever is lovely, what is excellent, whatever is pure. And what is excellent and pure? Christ. He is my righteousness. And it is by him I am led through this. God dwells with his consecrated kingdom of priests. How did we Christians get our priestly garments? Garments which clothes any exposure toward God's holiness. To feast before the Lord as holy anointed with a pleasing aroma of unity before God. Let me see this as we draw to a close. Verse 46 of Exodus 29. The Lord says, They shall know. That I am Yahweh, their God, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, that I might dwell among them. I am Yahweh, their God. He is telling them exactly where they came from and for what purpose he saved them. What purpose does God save us? He is to prove that he is the Lord, our God, and that he lives with us. And that is a power of display. And all this, all this priesthood, all this ordination, consecration, these sacrifices, this is a sign for all to see that Yahweh dwells with his people, the people he delivered out of Egypt, out of slavery. He calls us, washes us, puts Christ's garments on us as Christians, unites us in the bonds of peace by his Holy Spirit, and gives us the priestly command. Go, therefore, and make disciples. That is our command. What does it mean to enjoy God as a priest? For how long am I guaranteed to enjoy this God who requires so much to enjoy this feast before him and to be served by these priests? No, notice who the audience in all of this is. Who's the audience? I think that's what I'm shocked by, even with the lack of this mentioning in a lot of commentaries. Who's the audience in this? Who gets to see all of this ritual? Uh, as a pastor, the temptation is to think my task is best performed when done always before God's people, always in the sight of others. And so what I'm tempted to do is place my value in that, my worth, my value as a pastor is 
how good I am when I'm here and you see it. That's my job, per se. But just as painstakingly the priest performed the duties before God's face as the people's representative, without anyone else watching, just God, I think much of what a pastor does that is beneficial to his, the local church he is called to lead, and her mission in that community is his quiet prayer life that nobody sees. The life that is away from the people. That we think that Christ has somehow devalued because he left the crowd to go pray to the Father. What value is there in that? Plenty. So yes, there's, there's Bible reading, there's books, those are things that I do, but there's also meant to be prayer. A pastor is to be praying for his people. Praying also for the cause of Christ. And I think that also emphasizes our lives played out before God's face. Coram Deo. You are always living where God sees. There is not a place you will go that you're going away from Him. So, who cares just how spiritual that you think I am when God sees and knows any unfaithfulness? So, same goes for every one of us, dear followers of Christ. Don't just play out your service before others. Don't just think, well, I'll just practice my righteousness before men, and if I can convince them of my good doing, then somehow that will be my errand ticket into heaven. No, because a heart that's bent toward rebellion, even if you practice righteousness before men, you walk away from the altar of the Lord unjustified like that Pharisee. Be cautious. I urge you as a pastor, be cautious. Be conscious how we are serving the Lord with gladness, thanksgiving, but also faithfully following Him because He sees all. He knows all. God is all-seeing. He is all-knowing. He is the searcher of the heart. So don't, don't think, if, I've, if I value my workplace, if I value my career, but then I mistreat my wife and children, that God is going to be okay with that. God is greatly angered at pastors who are only good when uh, around the church and yet a terrible person everywhere else. And yet the same wrath goes for any one of us because you and I have the same grace extended to us and we live by the same faith and we do this together. So don't, don't, don't hold yourself to a different critique. When, when you pray, Lord, search me and know me like the psalmist, like David. What does the Lord see? When, you, when he answers that prayer. And think long and hard about that. What does he see? You know, I have been given so many answers to that question, even from folks claiming to be Christians. I, they'll say, well, I think, I think God sees someone that's trying their best. Hmm. I think God sees someone who does more good than bad. I think I have been a I have a good heart. I just mess up every now and then. That's, I think that's what God sees. And that's, that is not the God of Scripture, beloved. God's all-seeing gaze to man's perfection. A single mistake by any one of these priests spells disaster because Yahweh says over and over again, you will die. I must be ceremonially washed. But after truly washed by Christ's blood, the bloody mess at the cross of Christ atones for me. So because I trust in Jesus alone for my perfection, I don't try to add to it. I don't just say, well, you know, I'm, I try to play out the best I can. I'm doing my best. I think when God's all-seeing gaze is upon me, no, I need to be completely covered. There is too much darkness. There's too much ugliness. What we call sin in the Bible is too vile. It's offensive to God. I need atonement. I need a perfect atonement. And I need a perfect priest to offer that atonement. A perfect priest who lives forever, who is perfectly and always obedient. The continued obedience of Christ is for me because I fail even now. So because I trust in Jesus alone as my perfection before the face of my God, God doesn't search me and find someone trying their best. He finds his best. He searches me, and he knows me, and he finds his 
best in Christ. His righteousness. And I'm hidden in Christ. It is no longer I who live. It is Christ who lives in me. So my plea to you is be washed in his blood, trusting in Christ alone to save you. Be baptized. Be ready as a royal priest in the priesthood of his church. Repent and be clothed in the holy garments as a priest to our God by clothing yourselves in Christ. Be a priest consecrated to the service of our God. And let us follow Jesus outside the camp way outside in that place that is filled with disease and death and frustration. Let us not be the type of priest who looks outside the camp and puts our nose up at the world and say, what a disaster this place has been. I wonder if somebody's going to do something about it. We are called as a priesthood to follow Christ outside the camp. And what is our command as priests when we get there? Shake our fists at them and show them how immoral they are. What a disaster that you guys have made of this world. No. Go, therefore, and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Oh, no, I don't know about you, but I take great comfort in this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We go outside the camp, but we do not go alone. We do not go outside the camp to our deaths to suffer unjustly and forever. We go outside the camp following the one who lives forever. So yes, we go out into this ugly world, this valley of the shadow of death, knowing he, is, he who is the tabernacle goes with us and he will not depart from us. He will see us through this exodus wilderness. He will see us all the way home. So therefore, we fear no evil. But we boldly go and go to the world proclaiming Christ, trusting he is with us. Amen. I'll ask the band as they come back up here and we become a singing church again. Let us pray to the Father together. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would wash us clean. We go through this world as sinners. And yet, Lord, when you come and confront us in our sin, you do not confront us with a chastisement that is offered toward a sinner, but that chastisement was on Christ. You laid on him the iniquity of us all. So, Lord, as we are now um, cleansed and clothed priests to our great high priest, who is Christ, we pray that you would strengthen us, that we would boldly proclaim your good news to a dying world as you send us following Christ, the tabernacle outside the camp. Bless us, O Lord, by your peace and joy in Jesus' name. Amen.